research in behavioral neurogenetics by becoming a member. Um, so today's talk is by Dr. Fair Vesseler, uh, who's currently an assistant professor at Tufts in the Department of Comparative Pathobiology in the School of Veterinary Medicine, uh, where she was a postdoc starting in 2012 and joined the faculty in 2016, if I'm reading your CV right. Uh, she also has an appointment in the Department of uh, Neuroscience uh, at Tufts as well. Before that, she got her undergraduate degree in psychology at Boston University in 2004. And she told us before we started that she's from Boston area. Um, and she got her master's degree uh, in pharmacology and biomedical neuroscience in 2008. Then she went to Penn, got her PhD in neuroscience in 2011, where for her dissertation project, she did work looking at deep brain stimulation as a treatment for cocaine-induced uh, relapse. Um, she also published one of my personal favorite papers uh, demonstrating the transgenerational effects of cocaine exposure, uh, which uh, I'm sure all of us know about, had a big impact on the behavioral genetics field. And I still, I still teach it in my behavioral genetics class as a, one of the new classics. <laughs> uh, uh, but that's really just the, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, she's been uh, uh, funded and has published on several other projects using a variety of invasive and non-invasive in vivo techniques, including work with magnetic nanoparticles, uh, she's been doing work with opioids recently, which we're all excited to hear about today in her talk titled Far-Reaching Consequences of the Opioid Epidemic. Dr. Vassiler, thank you so much for being with us today uh, and take it away whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you so much. What a nice, uh, nice introduction. That was very um, flattering. Um, yeah, so today I am going to be talking about some of the more recent work that I did, still looking at some transgenerational effects, um, but really switching focus now and looking at the effects of opioid exposure rather than cocaine exposure. But as you'll see, it gets a little bit uh, more complicated than that. Um, if I have time, and I was going through my talk this past week, and I'm not sure I'm going to get have time to get to part two, but if I do have a little bit of extra time, I'd love to tell you a little bit about my uh, magnetic nanoparticle work that I'm doing, but the primary focus of the talk today is going to be um, this part one, the impact of female or male adolescent opioid exposure on future offspring. So I don't think I need to tell anybody here that the United States is in the midst of an opioid epidemic. And I think that this graphic is really stunning, that it shows the opioid overdose deaths per 100,000 people. And really, when I look at this, what I think about is if these are the people that are dying from opioid use and abuse, just imagine the extent of the problem, because there are so many additional people using and abusing opioids that are not overdosing and dying from this. So this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the levels of exposure of opioids across the population. And then I just think it's interesting to note that about 130 Americans die every day from the opioid overdose crisis. And this was from 2018. The rates have actually gone up since then. I think in 2021, over 101,000 people died from an opioid overdose. Um, and I had before, uh, that was in contrast to the um, COVID-19 pandemic, where thousands of Americans were dying every day from COVID-19. And I think it, when these two uh, epidemics and pandemics come together, it, they're going to really increase this rates of opioid exposure. The New York Times labeled the COVID-19 a national relapse trigger, and I think really the isolation and the disruption in our daily lives from the pandemic is really going to exacerbate the opioid epidemic. In fact, if you look at the trends, there the level of opioid exposure was leveling off, but it started to increase again. 
So we're waiting for those statistics to be published, but I think it's it's not going to be good. Um, and so along those lines, if instead of looking at opioid overdose deaths, if you begin to think about the levels of exposures across the population, this is data from 2016, and you can see that really a lot of people are being exposed to these drugs. So 4.4% of individuals 12 and older have been exposed to opioids in their life. And if you look at these adolescent ages, 18 to 25, you're up to 7.3% of the population exposed to opioids in their lifetime. So this is a massive amount of exposure for people. And this is particularly troubling because opioids are actually powerful regulators of the neuroendocrine development. So not only do they have neural consequences, but there's actually the HPG, hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, that is getting regulated during adolescence and exogenous opioid exposure during this time period could have really big consequences. So this is sort of the setup for our model. What we're looking at is this adolescent exposure. So during adolescence, you have this wide level of opioid exposure. You're also having reproductive maturation and neuronal maturation that are all regulated by opioids. So this sets it up that the adolescent exposure can have consequences that last even despite discontinued use. So this is what I'm going to be calling the F0 generation or the parent generation. These are individuals that experimented with opioids during adolescence, or perhaps they were prescribed opioids for a common procedure like a tooth extraction. Uh, but whatever the reason, they had opioid exposure during adolescence, and then they grew up and they're no longer having any opioid exposure. They just have this history of opioid exposure. So there's no prenatal exposure to opioids. It's all this adolescent history of exposure. So this F0 generation had preconception exposure, but the, you know, the gonadal tissue is still there. So technically, these are multi-generational experiments where both the F0 and the F1 generation have this direct exposure, although it's only on the oocytes or the spermatogonia. Those are the tissues that have that exposure in the F1 generation. So we use rats to model all of this human behavior. And this is what our adolescent exposure paradigm looks like. We give increasing doses of morphine from postnatal day 30 to 39. Um, and then we allow them to wait drug-free till at least postnatal day 70 during adulthood when we mate them with naive um, animals of the opposite sex. So you just have my little adolescent cute rat here and a picture of an opioid uh, a poppy flower which has um, morphine in it. So with this setup, first I'm going to talk about exposure in female adolescents. So we have two female rats here, one that has a history of saline injections and one that has a history of morphine injections. They are mated with naive male rats to make the next generation, the F1 generation. And it's this generation during adulthood that I'm going to be showing you the data for. And I really like to hammer this point home because those people that are not familiar with this, it's when I'm calling them morphine F1 animals, sometimes you forget how distant that morphine exposure really was. It was 10 days in their parents' adolescence. That's where the exposure happened. So the first question I asked was whether maternal morphine exposure would affect addiction-like behaviors in the F1 generation. And we can model all of these human cycle of addiction with our rodent models. So in the human cycle addiction, following an initial use, a certain percentage of individuals go into this cycle of compulsive drug taking and seeking, followed by rehabilitation and abstinence, and then inevitably relapse. So there's this cycle of addiction um, that we can model all of this in rodents. And so the way we do that is with our self-administration and reinstatement paradigms. So I implant a catheter into the external jugular vein of these rats, and then they can press a lever in an operant chamber and give themselves an infusion of drug. 
So we start them off on a fixed ratio schedule of reinforcement. And during this schedule, we slowly step them up from a fixed ratio one schedule to a fixed ratio five schedule. So they have to press the lever five times to receive a single infusion. And we're gonna be testing these animals for both morphine and cocaine self-administration in separate cohorts of litter mates. So this phase of the experiment, we're really trying to model addiction, drug taking and reward. The progressive ratio schedule, which arguably works better in stimulant self-administration than opioid self-administration, and we can talk about that a little bit if you want to later, we use this to measure how hard the animal is willing to work for a single infusion of drugs. So for each subsequent uh, infusion, they have to press the lever more and more times. And so this is a, a measure of how hard they're willing to work for the drug. And then we take all the drug away and there's only saline in the syringe now. So now we're asking them, how long does it take you to stop learning to press that lever? So animals that are more motivated, it takes them a little bit longer to extinguish that behavior. Um, once they're extinguished, this is how we model abstinence. Um, we can give them a small priming injection of the drug that they were trained on. And even though there's still saline in the syringe, their lever responding goes up similar to the levels during the self-administration phase. And this is how we model relapse or drug seeking behavior. So all of these things we can model with our rats. And these are, this is what we wanted to look at first was what is your mother's history of adolescent drug exposure? How does that affect your addiction liability like behaviors? So here I'm showing you side by side litter mates these are animals that were exposed to either morphine self-administration or cocaine self-administration. And we've actually done full dose response curves of these. And I selected these doses in particular because if you look at their acquisition, there are no differences here. So in the white squares, we see saline F1 animals and in the blue squares, it's morphine and it's white and red for the animals that are self-administering cocaine. So you can see that there's no difference in their acquisition in the number of infusions that they take when they're learning to take uh, the drug. This here is their responses on the progressive ratio. So how hard they're willing to work again, we don't see any differences for the animals that are training on morphine. However, with the cocaine, we're beginning to see this increased motivation to take cocaine in, in these animals. So the work that um, Paul was referring to in the introduction, we actually had animals that were self-administering cocaine during adulthood have offspring and that we saw that they took less cocaine. So now we're seeing animals that are given morphine during adolescence, their offspring take more cocaine. So this was actually a pretty interesting finding, but it gets a little bit more complicated than that as we move on. Here I'm showing you the extinction phase. So you can see again, no differences with morphine self-administration, but with cocaine, we have these increased extinction bursts at the beginning where they're seeking the cocaine. So this indicates to us that they they're have a higher uh, likelihood to find cocaine rewarding and be searching for cocaine. So it's an increased uh, susceptibility to addiction-like behaviors in these morphine F1 animals. Now um, we're, I'm showing you their reinstatement data. So in this whole time, we didn't see any differences with the morphine self-administration. Now, when we get into the reinstatement behavior, we actually see this blunted reinstatement for morphine in these morphine F1 animals. So like I was alluding to with the cocaine animals that were exposed to cocaine in adulthood, their offspring had blunted responses to cocaine. If you have, if you're a, a dam and you were exposed to morphine during adolescence, now you also have blunted um, reinstatement behaviors to the same drug. And it's the exact opposite with cocaine. So we have this increased reinstatement behavior for cocaine, which is sort of similar to what we saw all along. And I'm not showing it here because when you get all the doses in, it gets a little bit more complex. It's a little bit more challenging to talk about in an hour long talk. But with this uh, morphine self-administration, we actually do see 
blunted morphine self-administration at different doses. So there is this consistent decreased reward for morphine in these morphine F1 animals. So just to summarize what I'm showing you with the behavior in this really simplified way, what we're seeing is this blunted response to morphine, but an enhanced response to cocaine. So we have this behavioral bidirectionality that we're observing in these morphine F1 animals. So what we wanted to do next was try to figure out what was mediating this effect, what was different about the brains of these F1 animals. Um, and so the first thing that we wanted to look at was the mu opioid receptor, because mu opioid receptor is known to mediate both opioid and cocaine reward. The mu opioid receptor in the VTA is underlying the increased levels of dopamine that you get when you ingest opioids. I think it's a little bit more, every, people are more familiar with the role of the mu opioid receptor in opioid related reward. But with cocaine, it's a little bit, some people are less familiar with this subject. So cocaine um, actually causes increased levels of the mu opioid receptor mRNA in the nucleus accumbens. And if you knock out the mu opioid receptor, you get decreased Q induced reinstatement of cocaine seeking. So there is evidence that there's this role for the mu opioid receptor in cocaine reward in addition to opioid opioid reward. So this was our first target because we thought, you know, if the mom had opioid exposure during adolescence, it might make sense that the offspring have some differences in their mu opioid receptor. So we asked, are mu opioid receptors dysregulated in this F1 generation? And what we found was that they were increased in the nucleus accumbens and decreased in the ventral tegmental area. So this is via Western blot. And the, the antibody is um, for most GPCRs are, are mediocre. So we're actually um, in the middle of repeating this looking at RNA scope, but we were able to see significant results using Western blot. So we see in both males and females, increased levels of the mu opioid receptor in the accumbens and decreased levels in the ventral tegmental area. So we thought perhaps that could be why we're seeing increased cocaine reward and blunted opioid reward because we have this difference in where the mu opioid receptor levels are expressed in these different brain regions. So looking further at this circuitry, when we look at the ventral tegmental area to the accumbens projection, these dopaminergic projections are projecting um, in the mesolimbic system. We also have this endogenous opioid beta endorphin and beta endorphin, which is the endogenous ligand to the mu opioid receptor is also involved in cocaine reinforcement as well as opioid reinforcement. So we thought that we would look further and see if this was also dysregulated in, in these F1 animals. So just to give you a little bit more background about some of the previous literature that showed that beta endorphin is related to cocaine reward, um, it's been shown that endogenous beta endorphin is elevated in the brain in response to cocaine. And that if you block beta endorphin in the nucleus accumbens, you get increased cocaine self-administration. So there's this inverse correlation with self-administration behavior, and it's also an inverse correlation with craving. So the more beta endorphin in the nucleus accumbens, the less craving that we see. So this is what we looked at next. And what we see here in the saline F1 animals with the white bars and the nucleus accumbens we saw that following an injection of cocaine, we see increased levels of beta endorphin, which is what you would expect given the, uh, the literature on the beta endorphin. However, with the morphine F1 animals, when you have a cocaine injection, you actually see the opposite effect. We see decreased levels of, of beta endorphin in the nucleus accumbens in response to cocaine. So not only is this significantly different from the saline F1 animals beta endorphin levels, it's also significantly different from their, it's lower from their acute saline injection. So remember this inverse correlation with beta endorphin in the nucleus accumbens, it sort of makes sense that we're gonna see blunted beta endorphin and increased craving. And what we wanted to do next was to see if you remember the increased reinstatement that we saw with these animals, they also received this acute cocaine injection, 
we wanted to look at their beta endorphin levels following um, the reinstatement. And what we did was we correlated the levels of beta endorphin in the brain of the animals that had just undergone reinstatement with their active lever presses. And what we see is that we get this inverse correlation that's expected with these really high active lever presses uh, um, with uh, correlated with low beta endorphin levels. So this aberrant development of the opioid system within these morphine F1 animals might be playing a role in why we're seeing this increased cocaine reward. Now we went a little bit further and we wanted to know where this beta endorphin was coming from. So beta endorphin is actually produced by POMC neurons in the arcuate nucleus. So the arcuate nucleus sends this beta endorphin to both the accumbens and the ventral tegmental area where it can bind to the mu opioid receptor. Uh, POMC is pro-opio-melanocortin. It's a pre-pro polypeptide and it's actually broken down into lots of active peptides and beta endorphin is one of them. So we wanted to look in the arcuate at POMC neurons. And I, I, I have a feeling that some of you are looking at these active peptides and thinking about some other phenotypes that we might be seeing in our morphine F1 animals if POMC is dysregulated. Um, and if you are curious about some of our, our other findings with these animals related to feeding behavior and metabolism, you can ask me during the question session because we have seen some really interesting results with that too. So POMC produces these, um, they, the products of POMC like beta endorphin regulate reward processing via these projections to the VTA and the NAC. So we looked in the arcuate nucleus at these POMC neurons. So this is in situ hybridization where we're looking at the mRNA of POMC. And indeed we see these increased levels of POMC in the morphine F1 animals within the arcuate nucleus. We went on to look at um, POMC Western blots again in the arcuate nucleus. So this wasn't, this was in response to either at baseline or in response to cocaine. And we see a main effect where we have increased levels of POMC protein in the arcuate nucleus in morphine F1 animals. But this is particularly true following this acute injection of cocaine. So to summarize what I've showed you so far with these females is that we have this behavioral bidirectionality where we have increased mu opioid receptor in the accumbens and decreased opio mu opioid receptor in the VTA, which may underlie some of these effects that we're seeing with the behavior. And we have hypothalamic dysregulation of POMC and peptides in the arcuate, as well as beta endorphin in the NAC and the VTA. And I haven't showed you the data, but I can tell you that we also have seen dysregulated corticosterone in the plasma of these animals. So we think that the hypothalamic uh, pituitary adrenal axis is disrupted in these animals. And uh, this probably also contributes to why we're seeing differences in their self-administration behavior. So I really, I can't keep a simple story. I like to make it really complicated. So uh, I didn't think it would be this complicated when I started off on this journey, but I was really interested in some of this um, paternal effects. So I next asked the question, will paternal morphine exposure have addiction-like behaviors in the F1 generation? Um, and I would have predicted before doing this, that I would have seen something very similar to what I saw with the females, where we see blunted morphine self-administration and increased cocaine self-administration. Um, that is not what we found. Um, I can tell you that, but I'll first show you a little bit about uh, this. Oh, this is just showing that now we have the males with the history of saline and morphine. And again, we're looking at their F1 generation. The, the protocol that we used for these was a little bit different. The reinstatement studies are very long. And so I was trying to come up with a way to um, test within a single animal, whether or not that they would have the same differences, the bi-directionality in, in cocaine versus opioid reward. So we have two separate experiments here. And the first one, we just did the cocaine self-administration 
followed by progressive ratio. And then in a separate group of animals, we did morphine self-administration. And then we did a within subjects test. And this was in the same order for each subject. I'll throw that caveat out there. They, we tested for morphine followed by oxycodone, followed by cocaine within the same animal. So these animals were all trained on morphine, but then they did one day of morphine PR followed by a one day of oxycodone FR1 and then oxycodone PR the following day. And then the following day they did cocaine FR1. And then after that they did cocaine PR. So I really wanted to understand if this was uh, a training issue if the animals that learn to take more drugs would take more of any drug, or if this was very specific to opioids versus cocaine. And of course, we saw the exact opposite phenotype that we saw um, in the female adolescent exposure. Now with the male adolescent exposure, we have blunted cocaine self-administration and increased morphine self-administration. So this is the opposite from what we saw with the, the dams being exposed. Um, but it actually, the previous study that I did with cocaine exposure in males, this looks really similar to what we saw with them. So perhaps this, this parent exposed parent makes more of a uh, difference than what drug they're exposed to. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, again, we saw this, this difference. Now, when we move them onto the PR phase, here we have the cocaine where we have, um, again, blunted progressive ratio. And with the morphine, we did not see enhanced progressive ratio when we tested them with morphine. However, morphine is super sedating. So it's not surprising that the progressive ratio schedule doesn't work quite as well with these um, when we are testing morphine. So this was also one of the impetus for why we switched to looking at oxycodone. So within the same animal, we then looked at oxycodone and here oxycodone is slightly less sedating than morphine. So now we're beginning to tease apart these willingness to work hard for a single infusion. So we have a significant increase in the levels of, of oxycodone progressive ratio responding in these morphine F1 animals. And then we switched them over to cocaine and we see this blunted response to cocaine is maintained despite having them being trained on an opioid during self-administration. So this was actually really surprising to me, although now that I've delved into the literature a lot more about the difference between opioid and cocaine reward, it probably shouldn't be so surprising that because they have such different mechanisms of action, that it's not necessarily going to be the case that an animal will demonstrate a common abuse liability potential, but perhaps it is much more specific to different drugs. And so that's what we're seeing here and we're showing that here. Um, so that was very exciting for us. Um, however, the fact that we have this behavioral bidirectionality in the complete opposite direction when it's the male exposed kind of made our heads spin around a little bit. We're not really sure why this is happening, but I think it's really interesting. And I've decided that we're going to, I want to pursue this, particularly because of this enhanced response to opioids. We see this enhanced response to opioids. I think it's really interesting, particularly given the current pandemic that we're in, um, the, sorry, the current epidemic that we're in with the opioid epidemic. Um, I think that I really wanna to begin to understand what might be changing in the brains of these animals um, and how might this be transmitted from one generation to the next. And not only are we seeing increased opioid self-administration in these animals, but because it was the male that was exposed during adolescence, we can remove a lot of confounds of maternal care and prenatal and perinatal environment for these animals by studying the males. So this is sort of what we're gonna be focusing on. And the first question that we really wanted to ask was how this could possibly be transmitted. So we're looking at this adolescent male uh, and this is his adult uh, seminiferous tubules. So these are the testes that we did immunohistochemistry on, and we're looking at acetylated histones within these seminiferous tubules. So 
if you're like me who studied neuroscience and was completely ignorant in the ways of reproductive biology, I've actually learned a lot and it's really fascinating. Um, these seminiferous tubules are the site of spermatogenesis. So as the sperm develop, they move towards the inside of the seminiferous tubules. So not only do we see increased levels of acetylated histone H3 in these testes, <coughs> excuse me, but we see this closer towards the center of the tubules, which indicates that these histones, these acetylated histones are being retained in the sperm as they mature. And typically when a sperm matures in order to fit all the DNA into the head of the sperm, the DNA uh, histones are replaced with other proteins called proteomines, which are smaller and it allows for the DNA to be more tightly wound around that, the proteomines so that they can fit in the head of the sperm. So the fact that there's this histone retention in these sperms is as aberrant in and of itself and that they're highly acetylated also is uh, very interesting to us. So we wanna pursue this. Um, we've actually been trying to get some chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing done with acetylated histone H3, but it's proved to be very challenging. So I haven't gotten any results from that yet, but that's one thing that we're pursuing. But you can see here that the morphine F0 animals do have increased levels of acetylated H3 in their, in their testes, in the seminiferous tubules. So with male exposure, what we're really looking at, the only thing that the males are donating to their offspring is, these, is the sperm and the, and the seminal fluid. Everything else is, we take the male away and they don't really have much interaction with the females. Although a recent paper came out that this minimal inter interaction might be enough to change the way the dam treats the offspring. So there is, that's not off the table completely, but looking at these sperms and how it affects the development is where I'm sort of going with this project. So we've been working on collecting blastocysts from um, F1 blastocysts. So we have the, the inner cell mass, the fluid cavity, and the trophoblast of these that we're working on dissecting, and we're hoping to look at methylation. And the broader idea behind this is that we have this environmental exposure that's impacting somatic cells, and these cells can either it can either directly interact with the germline cells, this environmental exposure, because there's actually both cocaine and um, opioid receptor binding sites in the testes. Um, but also it could be that there's something happening in the brain and it's releasing extracellular vesicles or other circulating factors that are then going on to impact the testes, particularly as we're looking at during adolescence at this development, and that this is then going to be producing some epigenetic reprogramming within the embryo that are then going to affect the next generation. So this is just sort of where we're, our broad hypothesis, where we're sort of thinking about these things. Um, and to sum up this part of the talk, I, I think that one of the things that I want to take away from this, because I've been working in this transgenerational or multi-generational field for a while, um, I really think it's interesting to try to come up with ways that we can relate this to humans, because I think that's one of the most challenging things about this work, is that you see blunted responses to cocaine or blunted responses to opioids, and does that mean that um, that it's protective. And does that mean that in humans, you, you would see the same thing? I think the human situation is just much more complicated. And what I really think that we need to begin thinking about in this field is really which systems are vulnerable to these epigenetic changes, which systems might be impacted that we can begin to sort of mitigate risk for human offspring. Um, there's actually some researchers at Tufts that are looking at um, more epidemiological data. And so we've been working with them to try to get into some databases to see if we can figure out if we can get any 
human data that shows that preconception exposure to opioids might have some effect in offspring. So this is really another thing that we're trying to think about, like, what is the human data with this? Because we, we, we get some pushback, like, how is this relevant to humans? And it's really challenging to try to think about this um, in, in terms of how it is relevant to humans. However, one of the things that's come out of this recently is whether or not this is, could be a model for increased susceptibility to opioid use disorder. So sort of ignoring the how is this transmitted and how does this relate to humans, what we have here is a model where we show increased susceptibility to opioid use disorder in a specific population. So maybe we can look at the molecular uh, or physiological changes in those animals and it can give us clues as to why certain individuals are more likely to self-administer opioids compared to others. And I'll just give you some of my most recent preliminary data that is exciting for this. When you look, when you're thinking about males, I showed you already that morphine F1 animals, these are now from, um, from animals, from male animals that were exposed during adolescence. I showed you they take more um, morphine, but we also now found that they take more oxycodone. And to bring this back full circle with the work that Paul was referencing, where we have um, paternal cocaine exposure, we actually did this with adolescents, we exposed them to cocaine, and we see this same increased opioid self-administration in cocaine F1 animals. So this has got me thinking, how could these two disparate drugs, which we know have different mechanisms of action, uh, how are these producing similar effects in the offspring? And, 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 and it's the dad that's exposed and not the mom. And really, I think this is what I was trying to get at with what are the systems that are vulnerable to these changes? Because stress could increase dopamine in these animals. Changes in diet could increase dopamine in these animals. So maybe dopamine is the key that's producing these transgenerational effects. What is it exactly that's similar in these that's producing these effects in the offspring? So that's sort of what I'm thinking about now. And before I move on to the next part of the talk, if you guys want to hear about my magnetic nanoparticles. I'll just pause for a second. I know I talk quickly. See if anybody has any questions about any of that data or any of those studies. Uh, there are actually a couple of questions. Oh, there are. Yeah. Okay. I, sorry. I couldn't, I can't see the comments. No, 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 no. That's, that's my job. Okay. Uh, so one, uh, one question that came up twice uh, that we were sort of chatting about is, whether exposing both parents would cancel out the effects in the F1, and whether you see that sort of same pattern if you look at family history in humans, uh, does what is the it does the transmission of the risk for substance use disorder depend on whether mom or dad is exposed? Uh, so I love both of those questions. I think they're great questions. I haven't done the study where I exposed both parents and looked at the effects of the offspring. As you and probably can imagine, these experiments are quite time consuming and expensive. And um, I was primarily interested in sort of getting at mechanism of transmission. And I thought if I exposed both parents that it would be too messy. I will tell you that Yasmin Hurd did work where she exposed um, both males and females to THC and she saw increased susceptibility to opioid use disorder in the offspring. So there is some evidence that it doesn't actually cancel each other out, um, but I don't know in this exact scenario what would happen. I think it's a, it's a really good question. I actually get that question a lot because it is interesting that it's the opposite direction. And then the other question about whether or not the humans, um, if there's like a relationship between um, familial addiction behaviors and the parent of the of origin that it's just too complicated I would argue to make any statement about that because with in humans it tends to be if either parent has a substance use disorder 
the offspring is more likely to have an, a substance use disorder. It's never really goes in the other direction, but if you think about all the confounding variables, the environment that they're growing up in, sort of social stressors or nutrition stressors or socioeconomic stressors that go along with that, it's hard to dissociate the parent of origin from the, the child's behavior. So there's nothing really in humans, the bottom line is self-administration behaviors typically tend to go up no matter what. So yeah. um, I was um, saying that, what does it actually mean with the blunted cocaine? And because if you have something like blunted corticosterone in response to cocaine, um, we see increased substance use in humans. If you have increased corticosterone in response to cocaine, you see increases in humans. And it doesn't necessarily equal the same thing that you see in the animal models. So humans tend to self-administer more no matter what, whereas rats don't. So I, I would say that it's a little bit more complicated. Okay, uh, I'm, I, I think I can agree with that. Um, uh, Cameron uh, has a question about other opioid systems and, and I'll add something to that. Um, he's asking, he points out that enkephalin's also bind the mu opioid receptor. Uh, and are released within reward circuitry. She, he's wondering if you've also looked at enkephalins or maybe even the kappa system. And I just wanna to add to that briefly, when you're talking about your bi-directional behavioral effects and comparing cocaine and morphine, the thing that always comes to my mind immediately is like BDNF, for example, that's bi-directionally regulated by those drugs. And I'm wondering, both in terms of how you get to the DNA modifications and the, the developmental consequences of that. Uh, have you considered looking at, at that? So I think that's a great question. Um, I haven't looked at enkephalins yet or kappa yet. I think it's really important. And as you guys all know, the opioid system is really complicated. So there could be something with um, different receptor sensitivities or dimerizations or like, I mean, there's a lot of things that we could pursue with this, uh, but not, I haven't looked at any of those yet. And with the BDNF, um, I think that's another great idea. And, you know, we've looked at BDNF in the sperm in our cocaine model, and we've looked at BDNF in the offspring, and we see these changes in BDNF. So it could be that BDNF is a great target to go for because it is by direct, by um, directionally regulated by the two drugs, but we haven't looked at that in the parent, just the offspring. And we do okay. see changes in the offspring. Uh, I do have some more questions. Awesome. Uh, Edra London, London is asking, um, uh, with the acute exposure to cocaine or morphine in the F1 exposure group, um, how long are the effects on beta dwarf been lasting? Do you have an inkling of that? And whether it's a, a pattern of exposure dependent, um, do you get the same effect with uh, like a more sporadic uh, exposure to the drugs that might have a differential effect on drug seeking behavior? So that's another awesome question. And again, we haven't done that yet. With the beta endorphin, we only looked at the beta endorphin in the morphine F1 animals that were either exposed only once to cocaine or following self-administration. So there were those two different time points. Um, so they were both after a 10 mg per kg injection. One was during like, just an acute injection in, in behaviorally naive animals. And one was an acute injection that was used to promote reinstatement in self-administering animals. And so we saw that decreased um, beta endorphin in both of those animals compared to the saline F1 animals, but the, it, it's not a super fair comparison in the self-administering group because we didn't have the control, which is why we showed, what, that's why I showed a correlation rather than compared to the saline animals because we didn't have animals self-administering saline. Um, we did have the saline F1 animals self-administering cocaine and they didn't have a correlation there, which is also um, a little bit puzzling because you would think that they're, if beta endorphin is related to their cocaine reward or their cocaine seeking, you would see that correlation, but it's possible that the beta endorphin just isn't driving that behavior in the same way that it is in the morphine F1 animals. 
That's great. Thank you. I do have I have two more quick ones. Yeah. I'm go faster. Uh, Judy Grissel is asking about uh, how, do you know of any transgenerational effects of buprenorphine? So with the buprenorphine, what I know of is just prenatal exposure models with buprenorphine. I don't know of any models that have looked preconception with buprenorphine. There is a lot of work looking at um, buprenorphine in methadone, in uh, buprenorphine maintained women as like as a opioid replacement if they're in treatment and they're pregnant. Buprenorphine is one drug that they're given. And so there's a lot of rodent models with that. Um, in terms of the self-administration behavior in those offspring, I'm not sure that's been looked at yet. I, we are actually in the process of looking at that in another one of our studies in my collaborations with Liz Burns, but, um, but I don't have any data yet to share from that. And I'm not sure I know of any literature that has looked at that. Thank you. Uh, and, and Judy gives you a thumbs up for that answer. Um, <laughs> Julie Blendy has a, um, uh, a two-parter. Uh, one, she wants to be reminded if they're inbred or outbred rats. And she's also wondering if uh, what the relationship is to tolerance and sensitization. Does that have anything to do with the opposite effects you see in the females? Uh, thank you, Julie. That's a great question. So they are sprayed dollies. So they're outbred rats. Um, and whether or not it has to do with tolerance and sensitization, we have shown in the female ex exposure paradigm, so the adolescent female exposure paradigm, that there are changes in sensitization as well as tolerance. Um, whether or not that has to do with the self-administration, we haven't measured directly, but it definitely seems that their opioid system is disrupted somehow. And I can't imagine that, that you could part, tease them apart completely. So I think that it is related. It just seems that there's this dysregulation, this aberrant regulation of their, of their endogenous opioid system in these F1 animals. Great, thank you. We have 11 minutes left. Is that too, is that enough time for a whirlwind nanoparticle tool? Uh, yeah, I can, I can zoom us through it. I'll go That'd really fast. Okay. Okay. So in this work, I have this collaborator who's actually a physicist and he makes MRI machines. And what he did was he noticed in some of his work, he's also an MD, a radiologist, and he noticed that he could see um, particles in people's brains in these radiographs that he was doing. And he said, where are these, radi where are these particles coming from in people's brains? Um, and the only way he could imagine that the particles were getting in was people were breathing them in and they were traveling along that olfactory nerve into the brain and that's how they were getting in there. So he came up with this idea um, and he contacted me because of some work that I've done looking at deep brain stimulation as a treatment for opioid use disorder. So he had this idea of coming up with a less invasive deep brain stimulation strategy. So that's sort of some of the background. I'm not gonna go over this um, in detail just to tell you that deep brain stimulation is being tested as, a, as a, an effective therapeutic for addiction in humans. And you can see here in, in deep brain stimulation, an electrode is implanted into a region depend and there's been uh, work looking at the nucleus accumbens as well as the subthalamic nucleus. And then it's connected subcutaneously to a pacemaker-like device where it can deliver current and it can adjust and it really, it's really um, successful for the treatment of Parkinson's disease and they're trying it in, in other psychiatric disorders, including addiction. So problems with deep brain stimulation are it's invasive and permanent and risky because you have this big neural surgery. Um, so this is where my collaborator came in and he said, what can we do that's less invasive? So this idea was that we can have these, these magnetic nanoparticles that we have a patient through a, an outpatient visit and hail these, and he's developed this MRI unit that can simultaneously image 
and move the particles. So the particles are inhaled through the nose and with a magnetic force, they are pulled in through the olfactory bulb where they can be situated into a deep brain structure. So this is the idea behind it. My role in testing this um, was to look at the preclinical proof of principle, whether or not these particles could have an effect on reinstatement behavior. So these part, this is just a little bit about how the particles are made. There's these little electrophoretic plates that the particles are grown in. This is an electromicrograph of these particles. Um, and this is the, the makeup of the particles. Um, one of the things that he's testing right now is more effective ways to get them into the brain. So rather than pulling them into the brain or pushing them with a magnet, we use these Helmholtz coils situated in all areas of the rodent brain. And in this way, you can use a turning motion. And you know the NIH really didn't like it when I said drill. So like if you can come up with a better <laughs> word for having the particles drill into the brain, uh, they thought that sounded invasive. So that's the, but that's the movement that they're making is sort of a drilling motion rather than being pulled in. So that's what we're testing. And you can see here, this is how effective we are at getting the particles in with the no magnet. Here's with the pull only, and here's with this Helmholtz coil drilling motion, we get a lot of particles into the brain. So you can see here, this is actually a, a postnatal day one mouse brain uh, with his MRI magnet set up. He, he was able to, you, this is the before, the olfactory bulb, but this is the after, get the particles into the brain. Um, and you can see here evidence that there's these blue dots are the particles within the brain. Um, but once we get the brain, the particles into the brain, what can they do? So this is where my role comes in in the project. You can see here after they're in, the idea is that you wear this um, wearable magnetic device like a cap or some other device that you can have at your home. So if you're feeling a drug craving, you can turn the, the magnet on the particles wiggle in place. And this wiggling motion is the deep brain stimulation. So it's magnetic mechanical stimulation of these medium spiny neurons in the nucleus accumbens. So what would this do? I was very skeptical about this at first. What is this magnetic mechanical stimulation doing? This is actually crayfish where this was a study that they did in their lab where they have a crayfish and they're looking before and after stimulation. And you can see that there is this activation. And it turns out what it's doing is it's releasing extracellular adenosine. So this mechanical stimulation pushing on these neurons is producing increases in extracellular adenosine, which can then activate adenosine receptors in medium spiny neurons in the nucleus accumbens, which may attenuate reinstatement. So this was just some other work by some other groups showing that indeed this mechanical stimulation does increase levels of adenosine. So this is not just us being crazy. There's, there's a lot of people that are looking at the effects of mechanical stimulation. Um, and this is showing some evidence that um, D1 um, antagonist quinparole can decrease, uh, oh, sorry, that this adenosine antagonist can change drug seeking behaviors. So we have CGS, which is an A2A stimulant uh, agonist, and it can change these um, drug seeking behaviors. So this is quinparole induced reinstatement. So here, this is the magnet that I have in my chambers. So you can see here, this electric coil around the magnet, which is producing a magnetic stimulation that is strong enough to move the magnets inside the operant chamber. And we looked at oxycodone self-administration followed by oxycodone primed reinstatement. And I just did micro injections into the nucleus accumbens. So this was not going in through the nose. This was micro injections directly into the accumbens, but we were able to attenuate reinstatement. So this is a within subjects design uh, counterbalance. So sometimes the magnet was on, sometimes the magnet was off, and we were able to attenuate reinstatement in these animals 
with the ma magnetic mechanical stimulation of these particles. So the idea behind it is that these adenosine receptors are located on the D1 and D2 medium spiny neurons. The A2 receptors are, are, are on D2 neurons and the A1 receptors are on D1 neurons. And with stimulation off, these are supposed to represent the particles. You have normal functioning. And then when the particles are colliding with the neurons, you have this increase in a, a extracellular adenosine which can bind to these receptors on the medium spiny neurons. And that might be the mechanism of action. This has yet to, yet to be tested. Um, where I'm waiting for funding to continue this project, but it was pretty exciting and fun project to do. Um, and so that was like a, a whirlwind tour of that project. And I'll just put up my acknowledgement slides here at Tufts at the Grafton campus. It's a beautiful campus filled with happy vet students. I have great colleagues, collaborators, technicians, postdocs working in the lab. Um, and, and I'll just thank my funding also before I take, see if there's any questions. I'll see, I can stop sharing now. Uh, if, if anyone has any questions, uh, oh, uh, and we're all clapping. Thank you. In our, in our, <laughs> in our various boxes. Um, if anyone has any questions, you could either just unmute yourself and ask it or raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, uh, there's nothing in the chat except for several suggestions on what to call it uh, besides um, uh, besides drilling. Uh, I saw I saw spiraling, induction, propelling. <laughs> um, I like that. Steering. Uh, I do. Oh, there are some oh, questions. Yeah, uh, do the once you have steered them to their location, <laughs> um, do they stay situated there permanently? That's an that's an awesome question. We actually have tested a variety of different materials for these nanoparticles, and some of them are designed to stay permanently. And some of them are desi designed to dissolve slowly over time. Um, and so I went back and forth with this with my collaborator and I suggested that I thought it needed to be there permanently because the, the way that the deep brain stimulation works is it stays there permanently um, and it's constantly changing the way the circuit is being modulated. I don't know if, if it needs to be there permanently for these these particles because I think it's just too early to tell, but my inkling with the way that the brain changes during substance use disorder is I have a feeling it's gonna to have to be there, if not permanently, very long-term. And the good thing is, is that it's only activated when you have this external actuator, this magnetic stimulator that causes the, the particles to wiggle. So if you're feeling better and better and recovered, then you, you can wear that less and less. So that would be the idea. I, uh, one question that I had is how do you, how, how do you know um, that is mechanical stimulation? Do they heat up? Could it be thermal stimulation? That's a, it's a great question. We haven't noticed um, any damage. Um, if I, I'll share my screen again. Um, we didn't notice any damage from that could be thermal stimulation, but so this is like some images that I have following the, this was a different experiment. We were, we were targeting the dorsal medial striatum to look to see if we could change locomotor activity with this, but you can see that there's the, the only damage really is from the cannulation, the, that, I mean, the injection. And you can see that um, one problem is that as I removed the needle from the injection, it filled the entire track with these magnetic nanoparticles. So we need to get a little bit better at that. But um, there, the magnet itself, when it's on, it's very noisy. So that could be a confounding variable. The, I, I think that it's far enough away that it's not gonna be heating up the particles too much. But, but I don't know, it could be. Uh, I didn't see significant damage that, that indicates that. 
The other thing is I couldn't measure in the in vivo exactly um, how much wiggling was actually happening. And mm -hmm. I didn't have a vehicle control. So a lot more work needs to be done on this um, before we can say for sure what's actually happening. But but it was exciting preliminary preliminary study. The reason why I asked that is there's a guy at UB here that transfects animals with trip channels and he stimulates them in the cortex though with nanoparticles, but he can't get them you know, into deep brain structures like you are. Uh, one sort of follow-up question of that is after you get them into those deep brain structures, can you, can you pull them back out? Uh, that has not been tried. I have a feeling it's going to be much harder to get them out than it is to get them in there. Mm -hmm. um, but that is not the part of the project that I was working on. That is, I'm leaving that for the physicist <laughs> to mm -hmm. try to figure out how to do that. I, I think his strategy, rather than to pull them back out, is to, to create ones that could potentially dissolve. dissolve. Yeah. Well, uh, we are uh, past the hour, so I and there, I don't see any other hands up, so I, I think this is a good time to stop. I, I will uh, end by just saying thank you so much for coming. That was awesome. Thank that was you. That was so fun. Thank you so much. It was good such talk. a great talk. I really thank appreciate you. it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, um, it looks like people are dropping off. Uh, so uh, thank you again, um, and um, uh, everyone have a great rest of your day. And thanks. I hope to see you guys all at a future iBangs meeting. Oh, well, that'd be that wonderful. Right. <laughs> good good luck with the projects fair. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you again for the invitation. Bye, bye. Fair. Thank you bye. very much. Bye, Paul. Bye. I never know how to yeah, say goodbye to everyone. Bye. It's always awkward for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a great day, guys. You too. Bye, Dr. Tucson.